Frank. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge also the fact that we're on Gadigal land today, the grass tree people. Uh, acknowledge their elders past and present. We we'll also note, too, that I come to you today from where I, I live on Darren Murrigal country, too. I'm uh, privileged to be and blessed to, to live on that land. So, Australians in gambling. <clears throat> we're told that it's part of who we are as a nation. Betting on two flies, crawling up a wall, taking a punt on the race that stops a nation, playing two up on Anzac Day, harmless fun, the racehorses aside, uh, generally speaking. But what we have now in Australia is a combination of capitalist greed and a moral and ethical vacuum that has spawned a multi-billion dollar industry designed to identify and exploit those most vulnerable with ever more insidious ways and means of assisting them to lose their money as quickly as possible. One of the most startling and rapid developments in recent years has been the commodification of sport in Australia for the purposes of gambling. Peter Vlandes, the chair of the Australian Rugby League, plans to launch the 2024 NRL season in Las Vegas next year. Unbelievable. In a surreal interview with the SMH this week, he said it was not about promoting the game in the United States, but providing Americans with a new wagering option. Rugby League is a tribal entertainment product, he told the Herald. What wagering does is add a little bit more entertainment onto the already fantastic product. I wonder how many people in Australia targeted by predatory sports betting agencies have now been entertained to death. A recent study in Victoria revealed that during last year's footy finals and spring racing carnival, 900 ads for sports betting companies aired on free-to-air television in Victoria every single day. The growing community outrage about the level of sports betting advertising in Australia is palpable. But sports betting accounts for much less than half of all gambling losses in Australia. There are the casinos and the plethora of inquiries into their links to organised crime. The Bergen inquiry into Crown Casino. The operator found not fit to hold a licence. The Finkelstein Royal Commission into Crown Melbourne. The operator found not fit to hold a licence. The WA Royal Commission into Crown Perth, operator found not fit. The Star Inquiry in Sydney, operator found <coughs> not fit. The Star Inquiry in Brisbane, not fit. Yet they are all still operating. The casinos also account for much less than half of all gambling losses in Australia. So on average, each year in Australia, $25 billion is lost to gambling. $13 billion of that is lost on poker machines nationally, and figures released by New South Wales Liquor and Gaming just two weeks ago indicate that in 2022, $8.1 billion of that was lost here in New South Wales. That's $1,000 per head for every man, woman and child in the state. New South Wales is home to 86,000 poker machines, second only to Nevada in numbers, but here they're just about on every street corner. As Drew mentioned, we're standing on top of about 20 to 30 of them right now. We still have poker machines here in New South Wales with load up limits of $10,000. And with $10 bets every three seconds, you can lose most of that in 30 to 60 minutes. But load up limits of that scale lend themselves nicely to money laundering. Load up 10K, play for a while and lose $100 or so, cash out the game and collect your cheque from the cashier for $9,900 in winnings. Done. In October last year, the New South Wales Crime Commission handed down its report into money laundering in pubs and clubs in New South Wales. It revealed annual turnover of over $95 billion through poker machines in New South Wales and concluded that billions of dollars being gambled was either the proceeds of crime or laundering the proceeds of crime. Drugs. Human trafficking. Of course, the first recommendation Michael Barnes, the New South Wales Crime Commissioner, made in his report was that New South Wales should introduce a mandatory cashless gambling card that would be identity linked to a bank account, thus removing money laundering through poke machines from the equation. But I'll talk a little bit more about cashless card later on. So why is uh, Wesley Mission involved in this campaign? <coughs> we talked a little bit about how in 1956 the poke machines were uh, legalised here in New South Wales for not-for-profit clubs. One of the few voices speaking out against uh, that at the time was the Reverend Alan Walker. Now, this is a very youthful audience, 
So uh, you probably won't remember Alan Walker. Yes, we do. <laughs> he was the head of what was then known as the Central Methodist Mission, which is, of course, now the Wesley Mission. At the time, Alan Walker said this, these very prescient words. Once these machines are introduced, we'll never get rid of them, and they'll destroy individuals, families, and communities. Curiously, uh, one of the other groups opposed to the introduction of, of poker machines in the clubs at the time was the, was the pubs lobby, uh, because they, they saw that it being unfair, as, as Drew mentioned. But of course, that all changed on April Fool's Day in 1997, when the poker machines were legalised in pubs here in New South Wales. That was the day the music died. Other things that uh, have, have sort of taken Wesley mission on this journey. We set up the Lifeline Telephone Counselling Service in 1963. Uh, celebrated its 60th anniversary just last month. If you go to the Wesley Centre over on Pitt Street, you can see the 1950s Baker-like phone that took the very first call. We set up Australia's first gambling counselling service in the 1980s. And it now, gambling reform now tops our advocacy agenda for a particular reason. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, after a change of leadership, I was charged with uh, developing a Wesley Mission's new advocacy agenda. I spent several months uh, talking to a lot of our frontline staff, identifying what they're seeing in, the, in their service areas, uh, what, what's happening in the clients, where are the gaps, what could we do better. Gambling harm just appeared again and again, no matter what service area I spoke to. Obviously, services like Lifeline, gambling counselling, financial counselling, but gambling harm is also coming up all the time with our homelessness services, with our community housing services, emergency relief, out of home care, mental health programs, family preservation programs, and our community home care programs. When I did a straw poll of our staff, 50% of them indicated that they had a family member or a friend who had been harmed by gambling. So the scale of gambling harm in Australia is staggering. The Productivity Commission a decade ago estimated that for every person harmed directly by gambling, another seven to 10 people are indirectly harmed. As a result of engaging with our staff, we developed three focus areas for our advocacy strategy. Uh, homelessness and housing affordability, suicide prevention and mental health, and thirdly, reducing gambling harm. Of the three, gambling harm is our key focus. We have been working closely with the Alliance for Gambling Reform nationally on that, at that level, but uh, there was a gap here in New South Wales, and so we've decided to step into that. A couple of initial actions that we've taken part in over the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, following the, uh, the uh, inquiries into Star and Crown here, uh, there was a push to amend the Casino Act to include a number of amendments that uh, would address not only the issue of uh, connections to uh, organised crime, uh, but we were pushing very strongly too for, for measures that would address uh, gambling harm and introduce measures to minimise harm. So a couple of amendments that we worked with uh, with the crossbench and the Greens on last year, which we were able to get across, was uh, included the uh, introduction of a harm minimisation advisory panel uh, that would be... Um, have members on who would have subject matter expertise in gambling harm but also lived experience of gambling harm. The casino operators will be accountable to that harm minimisation panel uh, every year to account for what they're doing to make a difference in terms of reducing harm. We've also uh, had amendment passed to introduce cashless gambling in the casinos by 2024. But of course the big opportunity that, that loomed on the horizon uh, over the course of last year was the fact that we're coming up to an election and uh, we had the opportunity then to sort of see how, how the degree to which we could make uh, gambling harm an election issue for March 25. One of the first challenges was to um, uh, prevent uh, what would normally happen in the lead up to an election here in New South Wales, the Liberal National Party signing a memorandum of understanding with clubs in New South Wales, mm -hmm. and the Labor Party issuing a clubs policy, both of which did the same thing and effectively gag any conversation about reform. Fortunately, this time around, uh, some intestinal fortitude kicked in. Um, the Liberal National Party did not sign an MOU uh, with, with Clubs New South Wales and the Labor Party did not introduce a specific clubs policy that would gag conversation about reform. On November 9, uh, at Parliament House, we launched a campaign with 10 other initial partner organisations uh, for a campaign called Put Pokies in Their Place. Uh, we had five uh, particular asks that we put forward that we wanted people to act on, the, the, uh, the government and the opposition to act on. We wanted to see them introduce an independent statewide self-exclusion register that would enable people to effectively exclude themselves from every machine, poke machine in the state. Uh, the, currently the system for self-exclusion is broken in New South Wales. You can only exclude yourself from a maximum of 36 venues and you have to approach each venue individually to be able to do that. And then after you've done that, the venues won't enforce it. Second uh, one was to power down pokies between midnight and 10am. 
some of the worst harm occurs in the early hours of the morning, uh, where people have been drinking for a while, they're chasing their losses well into the early hours of the morning. Um, even the New South Wales government's own research has indicated the, the, uh, how extensive the, the amount of harm that occurs after midnight is. There is a, um, some of the uh, venues licensed in New South Wales can be open until 6am, uh, reopening three hours later at 9am. Uh, we also wanted uh, uh, local governments to have more, a say, uh, more of a say on uh, poker machine applications in their areas. There is a very bizarre carve out in the Planning Act, uh, preventing local councils making submissions to New South Wales Liquor and Gaming about their concerns in this area. We want to see more transparency around the data that Liquor and Gaming are collecting as well, including venue level data to assist with harm minimisation and prevention measures. Data at the moment uh, that was released is only, is only at the uh, LGA level, with reporting periods different for pubs and clubs. Uh, the government needs to charge people $300 to access this information, but the then Green M's, Greens MP, Justin Field, uh, paid $300, started loading all the data up onto his website and releasing it for free. So now Liquor and Gaming are obliged to do that themselves. And of course, the, the, the main uh, call we put out for was the introduction of a mandatory cashless gaming card with harm minimisation measures built in. So uh, in the lead up to the election, we continued to build uh, that coalition, uh, building from initial 10 organisations to about 30 organisations now, uh, NGOs and community service organisations, faith groups and unions. We also launched a, se a separate uh, campaign called Pokies You're Being Played, uh, which was for individuals to sign up and join the movement platform. And today we've had about 1,500 members sign up there, highly motivated people who have um, been making themselves known to the new gaming minister over the last two weeks. Uh, and we're looking to have many, many thousands more people sign up to that movement as well. So in the lead up to the election, uh, gaming reform, gambling reform and, and the cashless card uh, became a key issue. Well, what does a cashless card actually do? Well, if introduced, it would uh, meet Michael Barnes, uh, the New South Wales Crime Commissioner's uh, recommendation to, to um, uh, reduce money laundering. It would effectively make that uh, not possible. But also it would reduce gambling harm if it had a mandatory pre-commitments for how much money people would be prepared to lose in a given time. The Productivity Commission back in 2010 uh, recommended a mandatory pre-commitment system. Uh, so that's how long that sort of idea has been uh, moving around in, in policy circles. Andrew Wilkie sought to bring in mandatory pre-commitment in 2012. The clubs back then campaigned against him and he lost the support of the Gillard government for those reforms. In Norway, uh, they introduced a mandatory cashless gambling card a decade ago. It has been a massive success and significantly reduced gambling harm in that country. And there is a significant body of evidence now to, uh, to demonstrate exactly how that happened. In 2021, uh, the then Gaming Minister, uh, Victor Dominello, uh, called for a cashless gambling card. Club's lobby uh, here in New South Wales didn't like that. The pressure was put on Dominic Perrottet, and Dominic, Dominic lost his portfolio, but not before leaving a time bomb. Uh, he had already uh, put together the terms of reference for the New South Wales Crime Commission to undertake their investigation into money laundering in pubs and clubs. That, 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 uh, that, um, uh, the Commission's investigation bubbled away in the background for two years before the findings were released in October last year. One of the interesting things too is that gambling has become more than just a single issue. It's become a little benchmark about the health of our democracy, and the degree to which a particular lobby group uh, can undertake state capture. The other thing uh, we noticed during the course of the campaign too is that the focus has turned from problem gamblers, I use inverted commas for that, for that term, it's a horrific loaded term uh, promoted by the industry, inspired by the approach of the NRA in the US to focus on the person as the problem, not the industry that's designing to, to harm them. Now we're focusing on the industry and how they operate. And things like uh, work that, that uh, Drew has done in his book has sort of, sort of lifted the lid on the way that the, the gaming machine manufacturers operate and the way they seek to create a, a such addictive pro uh, products. Focusing on the industry and, and uh, their guilt in this process has also helped lift the veil of shame and stigma and empower people with lived experience of gambling harm to speak up and share their stories. Um, I think the story in the Wetworth Courier uh, uh, this, just this week uh, has, has the story of one, one man, Tim Gray, who I've gotten to know quite well over the last few months. Uh, he had got to the point where he almost took his life by driving his car into a tree when he, when he owed $700. K 
Kate Cecilia is another person I've got to know quite well over the last 12 months. Kate uh, lost 12, her, 12 years of her life to poker machine addiction. She's a mother of six children. When she was pregnant with her sixth child, she was contemplating taking her own life, but wouldn't do it because she couldn't think of a way to do it where she, her baby would survive. In the lead up to the March 25 election, both major parties launched reform policies. Both had good points to them, but both of them were significantly compromised as well. So the coalition's compromise policy. Yes, they wanted to introduce a mandatory cashless gambling card, but they didn't want any mandatory pre-commitment levels. They had a political philosophical objection to telling people what they can't and can do with their money. They had a five-year implementation window for that card, kicking the can into the next term of parliament. Plus, and this is the thing that really grated me the most, a $386 million rescue package for the industry. When I heard that, I was reminded of how the British government paid compensation, compensation to slave traders after banning the Atlantic <laughs> slave trade. Then there was the ALP's compromise policy. They had some good elements, uh, ending uh, political donations from clubs, removing poker machine signage from outside pubs and clubs, introducing trained responsible gambling, uh, gambling officers in venues, but no mandatory cashless card. Instead, a 500 machine trial to build an evidence base to make a decision later on. Well, the evidence is already in. We've seen what happened in Norway. The technology works. It prevents money laundering and reduces harm. A trial can easily be set up to fail. Who decides and oversees it? The industry? That's like putting Dracula in charge of the blood bank. So how do we shape up in terms of community opinions around this issue in the lead up to the election? In the lead up to the March 25 poll, a YouGov polling indicated 76% support for a mandatory cashless gaming card for people in New South Wales. The issue was high on the political agenda, but was low on the list of issues that would influence people's voting intentions. Polling commissioned by the SMH revealed only 7% of people saying that the issue of gambling reform would influence actually how they would vote. So our question today is, who's afraid of a cashless card? The answer to that question is actually quite simple. It's anyone who stands to lose some of the massive profits they currently make from the misery imposed by poker machines on the people of New South Wales. The Australian Hotels Association, and hotel chain groups like the Endeavour Group. Clubs New South Wales and the suburban pokey palaces too heavily reliant on poker machines. If what we've learned from the Crime Commission is true, pubs and clubs with poker machines have knowingly been profiting from the proceeds of crime, and a card would significantly reduce that income stream. A more interesting question for us to consider might actually be who isn't afraid of a cashless card? Aristocrat gaming and other poker machine manufacturers aren't afraid. If 86,000 poker machines in New South Wales need to be upgraded or replaced, there's a lot of money to be made doing it. Those businesses are also diversifying. Aristocrats' fastest growing business is the rapidly growing area of social casinos. Smartphone games that are identical to their most well-known poker machines, but with one key difference. To play, you have to purchase online tokens and the games don't allow the player to cash out their winnings, only keep in the game the tokens that they don't lose. Consequently, these so-called social casinos aren't classified as gambling and instead classified as games. They've been freely available to children and young people under 18, and like, like their non-virtual versions, they are addicting people, as they are designed to do, and causing harm. It emphasises the sad psychology behind poker machines that many people aren't ultimately playing to win, but to escape. Who else isn't afraid? The 44% of pubs in New South Wales who don't have poker machines and remain financially viable, they're not afraid. The 20% of clubs in New South Wales that have no poker machines and remain financially viable, they're not afraid. Like the wonderful Petersham Bowling Club, who dumped their poker machines 15 years ago and increased their uh, profits uh, by 800% in that time. The regular users of poker machines aren't afraid. Those being directly harmed by poker machines. Prior to the 25th March election, internal Liberal Party polling revealed that support for cashless gambling card was higher for more frequent poker machine users. 41% of people who used poker machines at least once a month supported a cashless card. Support rose to 65% for people who use poker machines at least once a week. These are people who want help. 
those being indirectly harmed by poker machines aren't afraid either. We mentioned before that the Productivity Commission estimated that for every person directly impacted by gambling harm, there were seven to 10 people indirectly harmed, equating in New South Wales to between 900,000 and 1.2 million people. They could do without cash-fed poker machines in the lives of their friends and loved ones. So where to from here? <coughs> Parliament resumes this week, and the issue isn't going away. Here's what a poll of 1,000 New South Wales residents just two weeks ago revealed. 76% say poker machines are bad and require further legislation. 70% think the New South Wales government is not doing enough for poker machines and gambling reform. 63% don't think the new government is fully committed to addressing gambling harm. 66% say they have a colleague, a family member or a friend who has been harmed by playing poker machines. 63% think the new government should abandon plans for a trial of 500 machines and instead follow the New South Wales Crime Commissioner's recommendation for the full implementation of a cashless system. 71% believe the gambling lobby has too much influence on New South Wales politics. 64% believe the gambling lobby has too much influence on New South Wales Labor. 36% believe the industry, the lobby, has the strongest say on gambling policy in New South Wales, versus 25% for politicians, 23% for citizens and voters, and just 7.3% for reform advocates. 74% of people in New South Wales don't trust the government to stand up to the gambling industry. And 77% say they're more likely to visit a club if it didn't have pokies. If you asked me a year ago uh, if poker machine reform would be as big an issue now uh, as, it, as, as it is now, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, at Wesley, we thought it would take us another four years to get where we are now. So let's see what the next four years have in store. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, and again, thank you to Drew. Uh, I, I want to kick off the uh, question and answer period with a bit of a focus on the political economic aspects. Surprise, surprise. Uh, in particular, raising the question about whether this gambling issue is a class issue. Uh, it's commonly portrayed as uh, a, a problem for the working class. You know, people on low to middle incomes who gamble more than they can afford to lose. Um, is, is that true? And on the other side of the story, uh, I, I, I mean, for, you, you might comment, for example, about in Sydney, whether it's a western suburbs issue or whether in areas such as here in the eastern suburbs, the problems, uh, and, uh, according to the statistics, are, are, are really quite comparable. But on the other side of the story, well, what about the, the interests, the powerful political economic interests involved here? It's, it's of course, uh, the industry itself and its representation and lobbying through Clubs New South Wales that's most obviously in the spotlight. But what about the government and its dependence upon revenue from gambling taxation? I believe that's something of the order of 15% of New South Wales state revenue every year comes through gambling taxes, and presumably the lion's share of that is, is uh, from the money going through the pokies. To what extent are those sort of political economic influences shaping outcomes? Uh, uh, you, you refer in your book Drew, uh, one last spin to a David and, Goli and Goliath story, but, but you use that title mostly to talk about legal challenges. I'm just wondering if there's a bigger David and Goliath story here of a, a fragmented working class that actually doesn't have the power, even though there's a lot of political support for reform, uh, taking on the big end of town yeah. and a government that's embedded in, in uh, the proceeds through, through gambling taxation and, of course, through political donations to uh, the major parties. Uh, I'll pass the microphone over to you, and then when we've got the answers to this uh, little uh, puzzles, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for further questions from the floor. Who'd like to get it? Oh. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll just speak briefly on the, um, on the first point of 
of, of that question, Frank, um, regarding class. Um, and it is true that um, uh, working class communities, um, you know, do do gamble more. Or like losses, the highest losses come from um, areas of social disadvantage. Um, I mean, some people might like to frame that as people again being irresponsible and not knowing what to do with the, the little money that they have. Um, I would strongly counter that um, and say that the reason that the uh, losses are found disproportionately in um, areas um, of Sydney in particular that aren't as wealthy as others is because that is an industry tactic. Um, machines are concentrated in areas such as Western Sydney um, because the industry knows that um, they will be more profitable there. And the reason that the machines will be more profitable there is because um, one, people are, or more people are looking for a form of escape um, because of their life circumstances or challenging life circumstances. Um, but another important point is that a lot of those communities don't have uh, a wide range of facilities or as wide a range of facilities as um, wealthier areas like the eastern suburbs. And if you visit, say, a, you know, a, a area like, um, you know, Canterbury Bankstown, you'll find that a lot of the facilities that do exist, non-gambling facilities, I should say, are either operated by or exist within clubs themselves. And so, a lot of social activity is um, is directed towards these gambling venues, and those gambling venues are designed to then direct people to the gambling part of, of those venues. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess what I'm saying is it's important to look at the, those broader social structures that are in place that actually uh, contribute to the losses um, within particular communities more so um, more so than others, and you know, again, you know, also it's it's in those parts of the city where the opening hours of, of venues are, you know, beyond kind of uh, beyond um, sensible, as 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 Jim was touching. When I mean, a lot of these venues will close for the minimum amount of, amount of time possible, three hours. And I have been to those venues at six o'clock in the morning, and there have been people waiting to get in. To gamble before work, and that, that I mean that is that, that is um, addiction on on display. That is one of the few moments that you will see. The uh, that that's one of the few moments that you'll actually see gambling addiction because it's such a hidden form of addiction. There are no physical manifestations of it, um, as with as with substance addiction, um, it exists in mainly dark rooms and in the heads of those um, people who unfortunately are um, in the throes of it. Um, yeah. Just in terms of um, the degree to which the New South Wales government relies on, on gambling as a form of uh, revenue, uh, I think the New South Wales is looking at um, gambling uh, Taxation revenue um, of around two point two billion dollars for the twenty twenty three point two. So not an insignificant amount of money. Um, Dominic Perrottet, strangely, um, in uh, in twenty twenty three April twenty twenty three, said he would much rather the government not have any revenue from from um, poker machine taxation. Um, but uh, that's that's obviously a gap that any government uh, pursuing serious reform will have to address. M much the same way as they did with. Um, tobacco um, revenues as well. And again, you know, one of the things I think we need to do in this conversation is, is swift, switch the lens to much more of a public health approach uh, to gambling as a disorder um, and are treated in just the same way that we did with tobacco reform over, over the years. And just with regards to the influence of, of the gambling lobby, Clubs New South Wales obviously was one of the most powerful lobby groups in Australia. Uh, very, very used to um, using political donations to uh, buy access and influence, uh, but also withdrawing support to punish uh, non-compliant uh, politicians as and when they see fit. Uh, we see that play out a number of ways over the last decade. 
And we've also seen, to some degree, that power waning. Uh, the decisions not to sign that MOU and, and launch the, the plus policy uh, last year was, was a really important step. That gave us permission to start having conversations like this and for politicians to be a little bit more brave about this. Um, we saw the sacking of Josh Lambs, the, the, the CEO of, of clubs in New South Wales. Uh, I think his board lost confidence in his ability to deliver on, on what he said he was going to be doing, which was um, maintaining a compliant uh, government and opposition. Uh, that was starting to change. We had that strange, strange situation on the evening of 25th of, of March, it was about a month or so after he'd been sacked, when Bevan Shields, the editor-in-chief of the Sydney Morning Herald, started receiving all these anonymous texts. Um, expletive, expletive laden texts uh, uh, about um, how, he, how he, he had lost the election and all those sorts of things for, for, for Perite, for the SMH's aggressive pursuit of, of the gambling reform uh, issue. Uh, it didn't take some of uh, Bevan's journalists in the Herald long to find out that the, the mobile number that those text messages was coming from was Kate Landis, Joshua Landis' wife. <laughs> so that was, but that was interesting. But again, you know, I don't think uh, this is Clubs New South Wales is an organisation that has a playbook based on what they picked up from the National Wealth Association in the United States. Again, I talked about how they, they use language that blames the problem of gambler. They are the problem. It's, the, it's just the few people who have a problem. It's not the industry itself and, and the way they operate in such a predatory manner. Um, it is true that there is a class dimension to gambling harm in New South Wales. Um, the, the, the LGAs most impacted are the lowest socioeconomic uh, LGAs in terms of you know, the CFA index and things like this. Uh, these, are the, these, are the, these are the people who the people who are losing the most and can't afford to lose it as well. And this is compounded by the cost of living crisis. We're hearing stories in our services at Wesley about people who are gambling in the hopes of winning money to pay their rent and mm. winning money to pay their grocery bills. Uh, these, these are people who are in desperate situations and uh, these venues are exploiting those people in those vulnerable situations. And again, it comes down to the ubiquity of the machines as well. You know, in the eastern suburbs, yes, there are venues with you know, lots, of, lots of machines, but in, in southwest Sydney, you know, when you, when you cross over the latte line, uh, you've got venues with, like, Bankstown Sports Club with 743 machines in it. That's not, that's not a club. That's a, that's a, that's a casino, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's a, that, that's a, that's a, a casino uh, designed to have, you know, industrial-level gambling taking place all the time and generating millions and millions of dollars of profit, dr sucking dry that community. These clubs, you know, the clubs movement in Australia, you know, they were set up by communities to serve communities. And now that model's been flipped. They've adopted this toxic business model where they now exploit the communities that they originally set up to serve. And that's just an utter shame. We need to break that. Just picking up on your your last point, um, when I interviewed the um, the now president of the Petersham Bowling Club, George Katzi, he was recounting to me, um, you know, the story of how they how they got rid of their machines, and uh, when George and and his colleagues took over um, took over running the Petersham Bowling Club, um, which which kind of happened by accident. Uh, they went to Clubs New South Wales for advice as to what to do um, to diversify their business model and the advice of Clubs New South Wales was just to get new poker machines which I think illustrates your last point of you know, the, the, the flipping of, of um, what clubs were set up to actually, to actually be. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, now is the time to ask any questions of our two uh, experienced uh, participants in this political process. So, uh, uh, who's going to be first? Maybe you. Right now, uh, thanks very much, Frank, and thanks to the speakers. That was extremely interesting. Um, first point is like a cultural historical point. It's widely reported, and I think you may have said this, that Australia has the biggest gambling uh, culture in the world and that we lose more per capita than any other country in the world. So I was just wondering a little bit more on the history. I think it goes back to horse racing in the 19th century. Or, um, and then, of course, the whole thing with, um, you know, the diggers and two-up and 
So we, we sort of developed that whole culture of gambling which seems to be ingrained. I don't know what we can do about it, but maybe a comment on that. The second point is I admit to being an addict myself. I'm an addict of AFL football. And when I watch it, which I was starting to watch it before I came here, gambling ads are just rampant. That, that, that I don't remember that this was the case a couple a few years ago. The gambling ads are the main ads that are shown. You know, overtaking mackets and and all this sort of thing. I mean, ha, has there been a massive increase in the ads for gambling in, on TV? I think there's another form of corruption that the advertising industry and the TV stations are completely. Uh, sort of addicted to, or you know, require for their revenue. So yeah, I just wonder if you could comment on that, please. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, on on the culture of gambling in Australia, um, I resist that framing very strongly. I think that. The idea that Australia has a unique culture of gambling is actually one that's been perpetuated by those who benefit the most from it, namely the gambling industry. And I think, um, or the gambling industry and you know their, their broader beneficiaries. And I think those those historical points about you know two up and um, such. I mean, I think they've been picked up as a kind of marketing tool more than anything um, that. The effect of, of, of uh, pushing this idea that there's a culture of gambling in Australia is, of course, to normalise it, right? Um, but I just, I just don't think that's, I just don't think that's the case. Um, I think you know, you could, there, sure, we have the most losses, and that's often cited as evidence that we have a culture of gambling. But it, I think that's evidence that the uh, gambling industry has been very successful. That, pushing its product here more than the kind of cultural element to it. And I think the fact that there is such broad public support for gambling reform um, is probably strong evidence that there isn't necessarily a culture of, of, of gambling um, in, in the kind of, um, you know, broader, broader nation. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's too... Or it's changing. <laughs> or, or, it's, or it's changing, yeah. Um, your second point around your TV, second question around TV, ads. Um, yeah, recently there is a um, there has been an increase in uh, in sports betting advertising <coughs> on television. Well, somewhat recently there was a high court decision that um, uh, it was in two thousand two thousand and eight um, that basically permitted. Um, gambling operators to advertise um, in the other jurisdictions beyond where they were um, beyond where they were based, um, which in uh, Australia during historical tax purposes is mainly the Northern Territory. Um, and that following that decision that was when the flood of um, gambling advertisements started. And yeah, I think you're you're right in your observation that um, broadcasters and uh, sporting codes are now in a similar position as governments were in the 90s when poker machines were legalised, um, or a couple of years after they were legalised, in that they are now dependent on um, that revenue, or at least they think they are dependent on that revenue and can't separate themselves from it. And you saw that at the recent inquiry into online gambling, where TV, um, uh, TV representatives and, and um, representatives of the ma major sporting codes were um, advocating to um, advocating for the status quo and to not um, uh, initiate any significant reforms that would decrease the amount of advertising. Um, in their own words, they said that, that would make you know free to air broadcasting impossible. Hmm. I think some of those um, figures around changing community sentiment towards gambling in Australia. Um, come off the back of that late, that latent anger in the community about the saturation of all advertising and sports betting. When I mentioned before, um, that, that, that study that looked at how there were 900 ads a day on free to air television in Victoria during the footy finals, um, that's, that's just 
you know, you just can't escape it now. And when you're watching the game, you, know, you see the odds. The kids are watching, they see the odds. You know, that I've read studies talking about how 25% of 16 to 18 year olds are using sports betting apps while they're at school. You know, they, they, they bring them in, bring them in young. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's insidious. And again, it's no longer some of those, we talk about two up, you know, two up we play one day a year, you know, and it's, 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 it's a legitimate game of chance. But the sports betting uh, algorithms and, and the way they, they utilize artificial intelligence now, you, know, you can't just study the form of two teams and say, yeah, this, one, this one's looking good, this one's looking bad. If you, win, if you win too much, they'll switch you off. If you're losing, they'll, they'll incentivize you to keep on losing. Uh, people are working very hard to make that the case. So it's, a, it's an increasingly dangerous industry and it's had a free reign in Australia for far too long. Could you please explain again how money laundering works with the with respect to the customers' cards? It doesn't work. So in New South Wales, we have poker machines with load up limits of five thousand, seven and a half thousand, and ten thousand dollars. That means you can put that much cash into the machine up front to gamble with on the actual machine itself. Um, it's a very slow and inefficient way of laundering money, but no one says that criminals are smart. But this is, this is the way that, that some of them choose to do it. Uh, I mentioned that um, with one, some of these $10,000 machines, you load up the machine, uh, you gamble a bit, lose $100, you cash out the 9,900 remaining, you go to the cashier, the cashier will issue you with a check that you can then put into your bank account as the winnings from that, that session of gambling. So that's how they, they're sort of using that as a method to launder money. Um, I, I was actually going to bring a prop along tonight um, that was given to me by Troy Stoles, who is the independent candidate who ran in Cogger against Chris Minns. He was the whistleblower that kind of triggered uh, the New South Wales Crime Commission inquiry. It's a, it's a money launderer's bag that he gave me. Uh, it's, it's a black bag that was full of uh, rub, rubber bands from the lots of cash that had been inside it, and it's monogrammed with clubs New South Wales on the outside as an incentive for that person to be using the machines. <laughs> Thanks. I just wondered about the political balance in the New South Wales Parliament, given that the government doesn't have a majority in either house, and given that a number of prominent independents and the Greens have basically adopted the sort of policies that you're advocating for, what are the chances of getting some, some more change under this current term of government? Um, we have a, a really a significant crossbench in the new New South Wales Parliament, about nine members. Uh, we've got Alex Greenwich, uh, we've got Joan McGurr, uh, Greg Piper, uh, we've got Helen Dalton, and then of course we've got uh, the, the Greens as well. Uh, between them, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm not spoken to each of those, those people, and I know uh, how in favour of uh, some of these reforms they are. So I think we're in a good position where the Labor, Labor minority government needs to negotiate with the crossbench now, um, and I don't think it's really a question of uh, if we go into a mandatory cashless gaming, uh, it's a question of when now, uh, and, and, and the degree to which uh, Labor will be prepared in the short term to give up their, their trial of 500 machines and actually move to, to saying, yes, we'll do some pre-implementation pre testing, but we're going for a cashless card. And that require a community campaign as well? Absolutely, yes. So um, it's, it's one thing to have um, it's one thing to have the crossbench uh, um, pushing for reform, but I think it's also really important to um, give the ALP the courage it needs to be the hero it needs to be for gambling reform in New South Wales, and that's going to involve um, yeah, grassroots um, mobilisation of people, um, contacting MPs, electorate officers, uh, pushing for reform and not letting people uh, you know, fall asleep on this one. Can we have a rally outside Parliament? <laughs> yeah, good day, uh, Brian from Cannon. Uh, two quick questions. Um, first one, slightly off topic. Um, ban the jobs, halt the jobs. The data is overwhelming. They're doing way more harm than good. 
um, Albo and the state premiers are um, under Pfizer big pharma control. Shame. Um, on topic. Um, yeah, I used to double with the machines myself. Um, after work on a Thursday, we go up the pub, and uh, I was a responsible gambler myself. Thank God, had a family and stuff. But um, mate of mine, like he'd uh, carried away, he'd just throw in fifty after fifty. Occasionally, he'd have a win, but um, if he didn't, he'd, he'd tr lose his pay packet on the day, over a grand, bang gone. Uh, I watch his uh, marriage deteriorate. He had four kids, and. Um, over the months, that she kicked him out and got him back again, and eventually he was gone. Had a divorce, split up. And a friend of my dad's, my late dad's, um, his wife had a problem. Uh, she wasn't paying the bills. She was losing on the pokies and uh, covering it up for him. Uh, went on and on, and he complained, "Where's the money?" Uh, next thing, um, she uh, took an overdose of pills and uh, alcohol and passed away. So there's a lot of uh, harm being caused by these machines. I'm just wondering, like, um, has there been any lawsuits, class action suits? Um, like, uh, the grounds are there. If not, why? What's... Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think that brings us back to the David and Goliath yeah. situation. Um, there, there was a lawsuit uh, a couple of years ago um, led by Shani Kagai who um, had suffered from a gambling addiction for many years. Um, she was represented by Morris Blackburn and took uh, Crown and Aristocrat uh, to court um, for misleading and deceptive <coughs> conduct. Um, so not so much a class action um, based on kind of the harm, but the kind of marketing of, uh, of, of poker machines themselves. Um, that, uh, that lawsuit unfortunately failed um, for, for Shonika. Um, I sat, actually sat in on um, a lot of that, that case, um, and the way I saw it, unfortunately, um, uh, it, it failed in large part because of the expert evidence that was presented during the trial, which um, was uh, to any observer in the courtroom, um, uh, let's say somewhat under prepared, um, and the industry or aristocrat and crown were able to pick it apart with, uh, with much ease, um, and for those who were delivering it, much embarrassment. Um, whether there will be similar cases like that moving forward, um, I would be surprised if there if there wasn't um, similar cases like that. Although it takes um, one a lot of money, um, unless um, a, well, I mean, even even if a even if a company uh, even if a um, law firm is willing to take it on pro bono, there's still kind of costs involved and more importantly the kind of emotional energy and knowledge of you know the kind of targeting and um, kind of attacks that will occur on one's person if you're leading that charge as Shonika um, found out. Could you ever see a class action suit getting up if it was prepared the right way? Um, would it get up? I don't know. I think uh, I think it could, based on what's known about the industry and its tactics. Now, I mean, I document some of them in in my book, and um, others have have documented them as as well. There's, I mean, it's similar similar tactics as the tobacco industry. Um, it's it's known within. Um, within the industry that the machines cause harm that was known 30 years ago and um, they speak openly about that. There are documents detailing that. So on, on that basis, yeah, I think there's a possibility that a class action could get up. And I think if we do start applying that public health lens to gambling harm, um, and we do look at the precedents from what happened with the tobacco industry. I think yeah, there, there is a genuine 
opportunity for class actions of the type we're talking about in the future. But obviously, um, you know, Shelby's case is, 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 a, is a, a tough one, I suppose, but yes, mobilising groups and resources um, in this is a possibility in the future. Thank you. Time for one last question. Uh, John. Yeah, my name, my name is John Wilkinson. I, uh, I used to work in the research service at the State Parliament many years ago. And um, in 1996, when I was just checking on the web, the, the publication is still there. I produced a publication called New South Wales and Gambling Revenue. And in the course of doing that, I found an article in an, in an American academic journal um, on the qualities that a, that a worker should have, thinking of workers and gambling, that would be best for them in a situation where a nation fully functioned according to economic principles. That is, that the commercial sector delivers services best, the government should stay out of things as, least, uh, as, as, as far as it can, the workers should only ask for wage rises that don't interfere with companies making maximum profits, all those things. If all those things are running, what would be the best virtues that a worker could possess? And the writer said, thrift. The thing that a worker needs most is thrift. And it seems to me that that opens a political angle or a political basis on, on which both the Liberal and National Party and the ALKP could be challenged because both claim that they want to operate on economic principles. We want to do everything by economics it should work by economic principles. So why are they being so staggeringly hypocritical as to undermine and corrode thrift when that's one of the very principles that economists say is best for workers? I, I, I just cannot believe this myself, you know. Um, and I just wondered what you, you would make of the possibility of political critics of governments and gambling using that as one way to, to attack. I mean, I think, I think that has been used as one form of attack um, and a form of encouragement for governments to reform. Um, but like other forms of attack, it, it hasn't worked. And I guess the reason, the reason it hasn't worked goes back to what we've been talking about today. Um, one being the power of the gambling industry, their ability to um, uh, assert um, influence on, on political parties, albeit a waning influence these days it seems. Um, to the kind of uh, attitude that exists within um, the halls of power, which you know you also see in, in the broader community as well, which is you know one of gambling being part of Australian culture, so let's just kind of run with it. Um, and you know I guess like polling showing that only what was it seven percent of, of, of people would um, uh, be influenced by gambling reform in, in their voting in the recent New South Wales election. I mean, for a government or for a political party that is only hell-bent on getting votes, then why would they, why would they run, with, run with this reform? Um, but, of course, governments shouldn't only be in the business of um, getting votes. They should be in the business of caring and supporting for their um, communities that they represent. And I don't know, from, a, from an advocacy standpoint as well, do we want to just, do we want to frame our argument only in economic terms? I mean, to me, that's, that's somewhat dismissive of um, that all of the non-economic aspects um, to, to this story. And I, kind of on that as well, the, the recent, you know, like, let's say enthusiasm for, for uh, gambling reform in New South Wales comes primarily from the Crime Commission's report about money laundering, which when I when I read that I was I 
part of me was pleased to see that reforms were back on the political agenda, but another part of me was sad that it took um, this report, this Crime Commission's report, to initiate those reforms within, um, you know, within within the government here, because it was saying we won't we won't permit the influence of crime in poker machines, but we will permit the influence of massive social harm, mm. of which there is far more evidence um, than the Crime Commission provided of money laundering. There is 30 years worth of evidence. Now I get that that report is, um, that report makes it very difficult for the industry to, or make the industry can't really argue against that. And from a political perspective, if you're in government, then you know that that makes sense to to uh, use as your main uh, your main launch pad into a discussion of these reforms. But again, that just it upsets me to to know that it took that report and you know evidence of crime over evidence of social harm to get this topic on the on the agenda. So. Um, you're looking into the harm caused by poker machines was sort of outside of the remit of the Crime Commission in terms of reference. They did, however, uh, receive um, uh, testimony in closed session from people who had experienced a gambling harm. So that did help shape them, the context into which they were obviously going to speak to with their final report and recommendations. I think one of the other challenges that we've had with the government too is that they've fallen for the, the, the club's PR smokescreen over many years of the, the community value that they provide, you know, uh, putting money back into the community, um, you know, the, the subsidised meals, the the, foot, the the soccer jerseys for the under sevens, you know, all, all these sorts of things. It's a it, it is it is a smokescreen. It is a power of smokescreen. The, the clubs in New South Wales are obliged to return uh, no more than two percent of what they earn to the community, and much of that is returned to them. In, Refunded through through tax as well through tax tax incentive. So really, there's there's very little benefit to the community, um, and the government has fallen for that over many years, and we all have too. We, 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 we all thought that was the way things worked, but the reality is that the community benefit provided by clubs is negligible. Yeah, I'll give it just to address uh, your question, John, too, by way of conclusion, because it seems to me getting to those political economic issues of what constitutes a good economy, what constitutes a good society, is, is the broader context in which this debate sits. Uh, my short answer to your question would be, well, that's capitalism. Capitalism has never been about thrift and productive investment. It's been about making profits and if encouraging people to uh, consume is more conducive to economic growth, capital accumulation and profits, well, that's what it becomes the top priority in the system. In, in an ideal world, we wouldn't do those kind of things, but under capitalism, it's those material economic drivers and the vested interests that are the most powerful players shaping an outcome. But even by those standards, it seems to me, the lesson I take away from the presentations we've heard is that this is a, 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 a sick form of capitalism. Even by capitalism's own standards, this is a sort of a dysfunctional process. It's causing people not to engage in more buying of, of products, tangible goods and services, but putting their money down the slots in order to uh, stand some possible chance of major windfall gains that are going to transform their lives, but in most cases have exactly the reverse effects and are harmful to mental and, and physical health, to family breakdown, uh, and ultimately to governments too, because the, the health services to some extent picks up the tab for meeting the, uh, the costs of, of that uh, social malaise. So even by capitalism's own standards, it seems to me that there's, there's dysfunctional elements here, and one would look towards governments that recognise that those characteristics and 
would uh, implement reforms, reforms in conjunction, of course, with community movements, such as we've been hearing about, that, that say it's really overdue time for action now before this gets it even further out of hand. So I want to thank you both of our wonderful speakers today, uh, Drew Rook and Jim Wackett, for uh, helping us to navigate this territory and get a deeper understanding of the challenges that face us around the questions of pokey reform and cashless credit cards. Thank you very much. Join me. Just, just to wind up. Uh,